I am seeing uh, faces that I don't know, and that's my loss, and it'll be to my gain when you introduce yourself, especially today after the service, and tell me what a great sermon it was. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, for those of you who are new, and uh, we are having people come and find an oasis here and love here and joy here, and we're glad of that. But we're having people unite with our church on a weekly basis, and we're thrilled. I'm Dan Stom, and that's my purpose of saying all of that. You may not know me. I am, have been doing interim work, and I'm between interim pastorates. And I've been a member here for 11 years, and um, my wife, who is in heaven now, but at that time when we were searching, we could not find what we felt met our needs, but came here, and on the way out, as we did, as we were going through that process, she looked at me and I looked at her and we almost simultaneously said, we have found home. And I see you agreeing to that and I'm glad. Well, by way of background, uh, just for those again who, who may not know me, I served uh, First Baptist Church of uh, Blue Springs uh, during the 80s for eight years and it was a challenging situation that turned out to be a blessing. Um, and I'm a graduate of New Orleans Seminary and uh, thrilled about that. <clears throat> and it was a privilege to be able to go there and get tooled and equipped to minister for these 50 plus years. I know I look younger, but it has been that long. Seminary does not cancel your humanity, meaning that when you go to seminary, you're, you're a person. And uh, I'm, I'm seeing some pastor buddies of mine out here agreeing. They would agree, you meet some weird, weird people there. Just weird ducks. And one that I'll talk to you about was named Jerry. That's not his real name, but uh, he wouldn't appreciate it if I told his real name. But Jerry was one of these spontaneous guys. You know, his motto of life was ready, fire, aim. If he thought it, it came out his mouth right or wrong. If it was an impulse to do and it broke something, that was okay because do something if you're doing it wrong. That was Jerry. And that was also true in the ministry at times. And so often what Jerry would do, be he just wouldn't prepare to the last moment, either in studies, uh, he wasn't the most brilliant student, but he, he was smart enough or even in his assignment. So he got an assignment to go to a church from the placement service. <clears throat> and uh, he got there early, and it was a rural church, and he thought it was going to be like many of those churches in rural Louisiana with cracked windows, no air conditioning, but just the opposite. It was refurbished, had chandeliers, carpet on the floor, the latest. And he said, my, my, I, you know, this is something. I better browse up on my message. So he stepped into a side room, and he was going through his notes uh, furiously, and a lady came in, and uh, she looked at him, and he looked at her, and she looked at him, and he looked at her, and she said, uh, you're from New Orleans Seminary, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. And she said, you're our substitute preacher for today. He said, yes, ma'am, that's right. And she said, and you're real nervous, aren't you? And he said, well, yes, I am. And he said, well, how did you know all that? And she said, you're in the women's restroom. <laughs> Well, I assure you, I know where the necessity places are here, and I'm in the right place. And it's my privilege to share with you. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 12. The book of Mark chapter 1, verse 12. And the word of God says, And immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast. And the angels were ministering to him. And let's bow for prayer. Father, we know that in our self-sufficiency there are times that you let us go to the end of our talents, gifts, or even our exhaustion to where we're desperate. And then you call us into isolation, a wilderness that you may especially speak to us. 
And we know that at such times we wonder why when we're giving in our own minds so much to you. And we are so fortified by our doctrinal statements and beliefs. But we thank you for these respites, these times of taking us aside, and for the instruction and the preparation that we receive while there. We ask, Lord, that as you have brought us out of a wilderness and that we would follow that preparation by faith, or that if we're in one right now, you would speak to us through this message, those instructions and any preparations or directions that we need to be better servants of yours. We thank you, Lord, that you teach us through your word, your Holy Spirit, never making a mistake in his application. Amen and amen. Today's message is for struggling Christians. It's for those of us whose still waters have been troubled and we wonder why. We're pretty good people, we born agains. We've come under the blood of Jesus and he did an overhaul on our life. Our language has changed. We know doctrines. The Bible has become our main source and resource for living. We realize that the old pilgrim song says that this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through and that we are pilgrims and we are anti-culture because we are Christians. And so when we get a landslide, when we get conflict, we are bewildered. We don't understand. Now, for those of you who camp out on Psalm 23, verse 2, he leadeth me beside still waters. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. I agree with you. That's absolutely true. But you have to realize that that psalm is telling us that he's brought us into still waters from troubled waters. That he has brought us to green pastures because in life, at times, there are desperate and desolate feedings are living out there. If you are also a person who has been tainted in your theology by the prosperity gospel, Benny Hand and those kind of guys, then you are disillusioned into believing that if you're a Christian and if you only have enough faith and are obedient enough, then you'll never have sickness, you'll never have uh, any discouragement, you'll never have any problems in life. That is a lie from hell and it smells like smoke. It's not true. Because we know that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and all uh, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for so persecuted the prophets which were before me. Paul wrote to Timothy, and uh, those who live godly for Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And, and so we need to get off of this thing that your waters are always calm or that your life is always at ease, or that you're going higher and higher without some dips along the way. That's not the case. The normal Christian life has its dips, its bumps, its hardships. And I'm seeing heads that are nodding to say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I've been there or I am there right now. But there's hope. There's hope. Because at each time that we come to those places, God calls us into isolation. He calls us into what is called a wilderness. And he does so for reasons that we're going to see in our message. And so without any further background study, let's dig in. First of all, the scripture teaches us from this text that God does send us into a wilderness. Mark 1.12 says that the Spirit impelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. The synoptics, the other three Gospels, says that he led them into a wilderness. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The point is that God may lead you gently, or if you're resistant, he may impel or let things go to the point to where you're forced to go where he wants you to go. Now that raises a couple of questions. And the first question is this, what is a wilderness? 
A wilderness can be sickness. A wilderness can be conflict within your marriage, your home, or on your job. A wilderness can be a time of discouragement or betrayal. A wilderness can be anything or any time that suddenly gets your attention to where you are thrown upon the grace of God, the love of God, and you need his answers because you're just having some doubts, you're having some questions, and that's normal for all of us. Did you know God's wilderness is a place of divine purpose? God sent Moses into the wilderness for 40 years that he might learn how to be completely obedient and to be Israel's deliverer. God sent Elijah into the wilderness for a a time in order to speak to him after his great triumph over Queen Jezebel. But then when she sent out her henchmen to kill him, he ran and he hid and he tucked his tail between his legs and he cried out, God, I want to die. And in that time of isolation, God ministered to him, fed him, gave him water to drink, and then spoke to his heart and prepared him to be Israel's fiery prophet again. God sent Handel into the wilderness of his own study. And that brilliant musician for 30 days, only for necessities did he leave his uh, desk and his, and his writing and his composition. And when he emerged after those 30 days, we had the immortal Messiah, which touches us every Christmas and throughout the years. God sent John Salk into the wilderness of his laboratory in order to go through research after research for month upon month in order to find a vaccine against polio. Thank God for the wilderness. Thank him that he causes us to go aside in order to find that isolation and that time where we especially are ministered to and loved upon and then instructed and prepared for other things. So what is your wilderness? I don't know, but you know. You know by the pain, you know by the doubt, you know by the perplexity. Understand this, God never sends us into the wilderness that we will be vacated or lonely, but that we will listen to his divine will and be prepared for his purposes as that comes about. Second question I have, and I'm sure you have, is that, well, what does God do in that wilderness? Why does he send us into a wilderness? I shared with you the basic generic reasons that is for isolation, get you aside. Secondly, for information to give you instruction. And third, for preparation for ministry. We know from Mark's account that it was to be tempted. And that word tempted in the original language means to be seduced, as Satan tried that, or to be tested and tempered. And Jesus, in those three temptations, as the other Gospels give us specific things about it, Jesus emerged the victor. Now you can imagine, he was there and he he had no food. And Satan's first temptation was, uh, worship me and and command those stones to be made into bread. He wanted Jesus to be a Messiah of fame or of tricks. And we could go through all three. That's not the purpose of this message right now. But Jesus had to learn in his humanity what kind of Messiah he was going to be. We evangelicals need to stress again and again that Jesus was as much human as he was divine. And the book of Hebrews says that he was tempted in all things such as we are. So did Jesus have temptation, hear me, didn't fall into it, but did Jesus have temptation to go on an ego trip? Sure, just like you and me at times. But in all things, he emerged victorious, and he had to learn what kind of a Messiah he was to be, and all of the things that the prophets had 
taught and he had learned about suddenly came into focus like a kaleidoscope and he realized that he was to be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and eventually to die in the miraculous death on the cross and to create the grace whereby you and I are saved. All of this came about with Jesus because he consented to the Holy Spirit's compulsion to go into the wilderness. Getting alone with God, boy, how we need it. Vance Havner, the revivalist, has well said that most Christians would rather spend a week in worry than an hour in prayer. And that's so true with us. We in America are so self-sufficient. We've got everything in an electronic age at our fingertips, and we equate that, or we dovetail that into the spiritual life to think, I can fix it. God, you just kind of move to the side. I don't really have time to, uh, to, to take this time. I can fix it. And then we find out we didn't fix it. We messed it up. It's worse until such time that it is so bad that we just finally cry out, oh, Lord Jesus, like Peter sinking in, in the water, save me or help me. And God says, I'm right here, my child, and I've been waiting for you. I've got a place for you. Come aside. I want to speak to you. A second insight, wilderness experiences are designed by God for a specific period of time for a specific time or duration. 13a tells us Jesus was there 40 days, and we know that that seems to be the optimum time that the scripture gives us for going into a wilderness or even for a time of fasting. I know of a pastor friend of mine who was dealing with some conflicts in his church, so he and his wife fasted for 40 days. Bless him, I can't fast from breakfast to lunch, you know. <laughs> But, but he did that. That's, that was his calling. I am convinced that our time in the wilderness depends not on God, but on our receptivity to what God is trying to say to us. So it may be lengthened or it may be shortened by our response to the Lord's leading. But it needs God's time. I repeat for emphasis, it, re it needs, in fact, it must have God's time. If you open a rose before its time of blooming, you'll never experience its sweet beauty or its bouquet. Cut into fruit that is green and yet not ripen, and you'll never taste and enjoy its sweet juices. And the same is true with the runner who runs a race. If he's not prepared for the right timing through training and through discipline, he'll never win a race. And we as Christians will never know God's full will for our lives until we're in that place for God's time for him to speak to us. And again, I don't know what your wilderness may be. It may be an experience of conflict. It may be sickness. It may be a whole host of things. And all may look fine on the outside of the cup. And we're past masters of saying when people ask us, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. God's in heaven and all is right with the world, but inside I'm embroiled and I'm churning. Now, wilderness experience, third insight, are designed by God for his specific purposes. I gave you those three, the isolation, the information, the preparation, but here we're told that Jesus was tempted he was tempted during that time, and it doesn't just mean that he was tempted to seduce him. He was tempted to temper him. Um, during the, prior to the second service this morning, the Lord kicked out an illustration that I was going to use. He does that with pastors, and he gave me very quickly from my own experience one that I think is more, ap more appropriate in my experience as a pastor, I came to a point of what was, in my mind, the peak of my ministry in a very affluent church in Oklahoma. 
And uh, all the perks were there. We were running over 1,000 in worship, and uh, at least in the 800s in Sunday school, uh, um, $1.8 million budget, and uh, they furnished a car for me. We had a television ministry, a radio ministry, and uh, I was uh, being called to do conferences. Uh, Charlotte and I looked at each other, and we said, ain't life good? This is wonderful. We, this is where we're going to make it. We're going to retire. And I began, uh, by the Holy Spirit's leading, to preach directly to needs of the church. And I preached on the right to life Sunday, a sermon on abortion. I got a call the next day from the chairman of the personnel committee, and he had to meet with me, he and another member, about some urgent needs that we need to address. Well, I'm speak slow, but I'm not stupid. And I knew that that meant this wasn't going to be the most pleasant experience. He took out a list of things, and he listed a whole host of things that I uh, had not done or should have done. I didn't visit the hospitals enough, and uh, just a whole host of things that were not true. And I answered those things, and uh, then he told me, and most importantly, you have offended some affluent members in our church. And I said, uh, excuse me, but I need for you to do, tell me what's the distinction between affluent and non-affluent members. And so he said, well, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the givers, those who, keep, who pay your salary, those who keep things going. And he said, the changes have to be made, and you might need to be thinking about where God wants you to be. Well, I knew God wanted me to be there, and we remained there for another year, and it was a tough year, and the pressure was put on. And eventually, I almost went into clinical depression. You see, I thought that if I did things, and we were baptizing people, one of the things they did not like was that we had a large bus ministry, and we reached into the bus ministry and the oil patch people, and we were bringing them into that affluent church, and we were baptizing them, and they didn't dress like those people, and they, they got real excited. I mean, they were genuinely saved. And those folks were saying hallelujah and raising their hands. And so there was an accusation about leading a church, charismatic church and a lot of other things that I'd want to get into. But Charlotte and I began to pray, and we just asked the Lord, Lord, in this wilderness, is this what you want us to do for the rest of our lives? And the Lord gave us a definite no. And then we said, Lord, what do you want us to do? And the Lord said, resign. Well, that's a death knell when you're 62 years old in a Southern Baptist church. There's just not many churches that they wonder about it. And well, even in the economy of today, it's always easier to get a job when you have a job as opposed to when you don't. But we did resign, and I did that graciously. I said, if this church splits, and it was about to, I said, it's not going to be because of us. It's because of uh, uh, some differences, and God has led us to a new direction. We were without a church for one year, and I want to tell you, God provided our every need during that year. Never wanted for a place to preach. We even saved money. And then I got a call from a church in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm from hot Texas. <laughs> Boston is cold. Besides that, they don't speak good English. <laughs> they say car instead of car, and park instead of park. And the church had Pentecostals and intellects and people who were uh, teaching at Harvard. And here I am going to that church to try to satisfy. And they had on, gone a split and were without a pastor for two years. That doesn't speak well and promising. But God said, that's where you to go. And we love those people, and we didn't go there to try to make them Southern Baptists. We went there to, to lead them to be better lovers of Jesus. Amen. We led people to the Lord. We joined with a uh, Jewish congregation, 
to uh, minister to those who needed food and, and got medical help for the uh, service people, the Brazilians and Hispanics, and we taught English as a second language. We saw God do miracles. We fed people in downtown Boston on the Saturdays, 4,000 at one time, and it was January 6th, I'll never forget it, and it was six degrees below zero. That's Baptist folks who were in the wilderness but said, we want out, and God will listen to you. When my wife got cancer during that time, my heart was torn out of my chest. My beloved, my sweetheart, my best friend was stricken. And we went through that, that travail. But it came to the point to where I needed to give full attention to her, and I was 72 years old at that time. And they wept and I wept as I said, I've got to retire and we came here. And when we said our goodbyes, it was a tearful time, and I said, we both want to share this last message, and Charlotte shared the last part of it, and this is what she said. Through a time of searching through a wilderness, God led us to you, and he saved the best for the last. Wilderness experiences are designed for specific purpose. I don't know what yours is, but I know that when God takes you through it, it's, you're going to be the better. Finally, I would have you to note, wilderness experiences are made bearable through God's appointed angels. In 13c, it says that Jesus had two experiences. One, that there were wild beasts there. Wilderness experiences can be frightening. I will tell you, during that year without a church, I, 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 at times I cried out to the Lord and I said, Lord, you called me, you prepared me, my heart is aching. We, not that I'm wanting for food, but God, I just want to serve you. Don't put us on a shelf. And the Lord blessed us with faith and he always sent something or someone. And that leads me to the second thing, that during your time where fear may come, God always sends his angels to minister to you. The word angel means messenger, my messenger. Can be a person, can be an angelic be uh, being. It might be as in the case of uh, Luke chapter 2 that that angel is glowing. But more than likely, it's something within your normal life that God uses to speak to you, but you can always recognize an angel of the Lord by two things. Number one, angels always worship God and lead you to worship God deeper. They never give you an aggrandizement. It's yes about you, but more than about you, it's about what you're to be about through you to God to make you better. Secondly, angels always bring God's message there's no confusion. It's always specific. So if you're in a travail right now and you wonder, God, with the time that I am in, what do I do? You just love him and seek him and he'll minister to you as he did to my precious wife during those last times and especially the last two months that we were given and we spent so gloriously together. As I stand here in closing, I remind you in the introduction, I said this message is for struggling Christians whose troubled waters, whose still waters have been troubled. And we've gone through some deep thoughts, and I think by your acknowledgement that the Lord has ministered to you, but I want to close with this prayer that I believe God will use to especially touch you. Heavenly Father, I'm in your appointed wilderness. At times I am lonely, I'm tempted, and I'm weak. Help me to remain in this appointed place of learning until you have finished speaking to me. When the wild beasts tempt me to despair, remind me that perfect love cast out all fear. 
Send your angels with your message of hope. Comfort, instruct, and direct me so that like them, I will worship and obey you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.